taken this time in the, in the next few weeks to, to, to focus really on the reality that it's our sins that drove Jesus to go to the cross. Uh, it's, it's because of us and our shortcomings, our failures, that Jesus needed to die so that way we could have peace and we could have forgiveness with God. We're also reminded as well of our own mortality. Um, as God told our first parents, dust you are, to dust you will return. That's who we are because sin has poisoned our life. And, and yet we look at his cross and what do we see? We see forgiveness. We see life and eternity paid for because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made. And, and so therefore ashes will not be the end of us, but rather life with God in heaven forever. We'll begin our worship with our opening hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. May God bless our worship here today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy and communion with Him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors in creation, and so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God, in his mercy, has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to confess your sins, ask our Father for forgiveness, and commit yourselves to this struggle. Let us be silent. Let us be still. Let us pause now for a time of reflection and self-examination. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return. Let us confess our sins before God and in the presence of one another. We confess to you, O Lord, our grievous faults and our willful desire to find excuses for the depth of our guilt. We are unjustly proud. We are consumed with jealousy. And in the place of Christian courage, we cower in fear and shame. Forgive us, Lord, that we may return to you and be covered in your grace and compassion. We continue our worship with the singing of our next hymn, Lord, to you I make confession. This hymn is on both pages four and five in the worship folder.
Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and suffering of your Son, O Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and by his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in the true faith and at the last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For centuries during the season of Lent, the Christian church has omitted the song of praise that typically comes after the absolution of sins. Uh, it, it's not that we are without joy during Lent, but the, the, the worship is a little bit more somber uh, with the seriousness of the season. So we continue then with the salvation, uh, the salutation. The Lord be with you and also with you. We pray. Almighty and merciful God, you never despise what you have made and always forgive those who turn to you. Create in us such new and contrite hearts that we may truly repent of our sins and obtain your full and gracious pardon. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. When, when times of trial come into our lives, people often ask the question of why. Why is this happening to us? Why is this happening to our family? Why is this happening to me? Uh, why are we having to endure this kind of financial strife? Why are we having to, to go through this sickness or this de disease? Or how, how come this relationship just isn't working out? Um, and and there's, there's a bunch of different reasons why the Bible gives to us as to why God allows some of these bad things, seemingly bad things, to come into our lives. The reality is that one of those things is that sometimes God allows us to face the brutality of his wrath in order that we might turn to him and find forgiveness. Uh, and, and so when these times of, of stress and strain, these times of worry and fear come to our lives, we take these as opportunities as his children to reflect on our sinfulness and turn to him to find the grace of, of, of our Savior. Uh, we continue with that, that thought in line then with Numbers chapter 21. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson for this Ash Wednesday is taken from Paul's second letter to the congregation in Corinth, chapters 5 and 6. The, the meat of this lesson that we're really going to be digging in and focusing on today is verse 21 here, where we, we're reminded of the fact that God set aside his son and designated him for the specific purpose of being loaded with all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, all of our failures, so that he could die. I mean, that is the purpose of why Jesus came. That's why he took on flesh, so he could grab all of our wrongs, all of our sins, and pay for them with his life, so we could have righteousness in return. Paul says here, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
God made him, that'd be Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. This too is the word of our God. Our holy gospel for this evening is taken from the gospel of St. John chapter 18, beginning with the fourth verse. Well, this will serve as the basis for our sermon later on. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. John records for us, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This is the gospel of Christ our King. We join in our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, What Grace Is This? This hymn as well, this is on both uh, pages 8 and 9 in the service folder. We'll join in singing this hymn together.
God's grace, his mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. Amen. The words for our meditation tonight are taken from John's Gospel, chapter 18. Uh, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This is God's word. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, in the cloak of darkness on the hillside overlooking the city of Jerusalem, Jesus saw the, the spitting flames of the torches that were drawing closer and closer to him while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, a place he frequented with his disciples and friends to pray and, and have solidarity. That night in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was a, a, a group of people who had sought Jesus out, but they were unlike many of the other crowds who had, had come looking for Jesus so many times before. They hadn't brought to him their sick needing healing. They hadn't brought to him their lepers or their blind or their paralyzed. They, they hadn't come to bring Jesus praise, hadn't come to, to pay homage to him. It, instead, they had something else on their minds. These men, they, they carried clubs and swords in their hands and malice in their heart. They'd been commissioned by the Jewish leaders to come in and arrest Jesus with Judas, one of his own, one of his disciples, as their leader. But when this mob of men and rabble-rousers had come to, to confront Jesus, he did something totally unexpected. He didn't try to barter with them, beg for his life, ask for mercy. He, he didn't bug out and, and, and head off to Bethany just a, a few miles away and try and hide out at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home. Wait till the, the emotions and everything had kind of settled before he could make his way and maybe find his way to a new country, do their version of whatever, uh, uh, some, some kind of new identity or something like that. No, he, 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 didn't, he didn't even call down legions of angels to smite these men and, and let them feel heaven's wrath. Instead, he went out to them. Went out to meet them. You see, because Jesus knew that this was all going to take place. After all, just a few days before these events, he had said to his closest disciples, to his closest friends, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. He, he knew what these men wanted to do to him and he knew what, what he needed to allow them to do. After all, this was the, 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 the pinnacle of, the point of his entire earthly ministry was to take on human flesh so he could walk all of our sins to that cross and, and pay to, to be the sacrifice, to shed his blood so that way death wouldn't be the end for you and for me. So that way forgiveness with God could be ours, something we can't barter or beg with him. So that way life in eternity would be secured. That's what Jesus went out to do. But, but as he did this, he wanted his disciples back then and he wanted you and he wanted me to know that his life wasn't taken from him. Though he was outnumbered, he wasn't overpowered. No, he, he willing, 
Lee went of his own accord. You heard it read earlier when this group of misfits and thugs and a traitor come to Jesus. He asked them, who are you looking for? When they responded, well, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus announced, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. Though these men had swords and clubs and spears in their hands, it took a couple, a couple syllables from the God-man and it leveled them to the earth. Again, though he was outnumbered, Jesus was not overpowered. Though they sought him out, Jesus gave his life up willingly for, for you and for these disciples. It's an interesting question that Jesus asks this crowd, and, and really I'd, I'd ask you tonight, since you've come here, who, who are you looking for? I think the answer would be probably pretty obvious. Who you, have you come here looking for tonight? What's the Sunday school answer? Jesus, right? We've come here looking for Jesus. The, the message of Ash Wednesday is, it's really bitter and, and, and cruel. We're, we're reminded of our own mortality. That all of us, all of us one day, will taste death. All of us. All of us at, at some point will step into the grave. Message of, of Ash Wednesday, it, it's bitter, it, it's cruel because we hear that what our first parents heard, that dust we are, to dust we will return. It, it, it's bitter, it, it, it's cruel because it really reminds us of the whole reason, the the point and purpose why Jesus had to go to the cross, why Jesus had to die, it was because of our shortcomings. Because of the mess that we've, we've made with our lives, of the times we followed the desires of our flesh rather than listening to the word of God. And there's no amount of bartering or begging. There's nothing that we can negotiate or offer to get ourselves right with God. And this is a, this is a message that Christians know and we hold dear in our hearts that yeah, that's, that's right. That's why we've come here tonight looking for Jesus, looking for hope, because in his cross we find just that. We find peace. We find forgiveness. We, we need Jesus to keep going and finish what he stepped out to do that night in Gethsemane 2,000 years ago. We need him to take those steps to Calvary so that way our sins could be paid for, so that way life eternal could be secured. And we know that. We cherish that Sunday after Sunday, day after day. And, and Jesus knew that long, long before. Jesus knew that was the point, the purpose of why he came. But, but in the lesson before us, Peter, Peter didn't quite get it at that point, did he? Well, time and time again, Jesus had told his disciples what was coming next. Peter just quite didn't grasp it. And though he had all the best of intentions, he's well-meaning, but his intentions were misplaced. You know, after all, think of how you would have felt in that moment, seeing this man who was like a brother to you, a friend, someone that you had, had traveled and ministered with, someone that you loved and cared for. This is your, your teacher. This is your pastor. This is your, your rabbi, your brother. And now these mobs, this mob of misfits is going to lay their hands on Jesus? I don't think so. And what does Peter do? He springs into action. He draws his sword and cuts off the ear of one of those, one of those ruffians who've come to rough up Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, there's a little bit of me that cheers a little bit. Don't you? Yeah. Peter had drawn blood for the Lord. Yeah, stand up, fight. Exactly, that's exactly it. But Jesus settles all of that with Peter and with us too. This well-meaning though misguided disciple. And this is what he says. He tells him, put your sword away. Peter had it all wrong, didn't he? 
See, salvation doesn't come by brave human effort in the face of overwhelming odds. Salvation doesn't come with the tip of a sword. It would take a cross. Peter couldn't save Jesus. Peter couldn't even save himself. Salvation would only come because of Jesus. And that's why he told him, put your sword away. Put your sword away. And we, we know that. And, and, and although we know that and we live that and we, we hold near and dear to that, it's easy for us at times to lose sight of that fact. Times where we, we maybe think we're somehow living our life better than, than other people. That, that somehow God must really be pleased with me rather than my neighbor. I had an interesting conversation today with a, a man who had 18 children with 11 different women. Now you hear that and some of us go, oh, I guess I'm not looking so bad. But are you any better? Really before God? Are we any better than, than someone who's, who's struggling with addiction, with someone who's struggling with pornography, with someone who's struggling with extramarital affairs with someone who's struggling with alcohol, with someone who's struggling with disrespect to the authorities, with disrespect to the parents or to the government? Are we any better than someone who's sitting in prison? Are we any better than... At times, we, we become puffed up with pride and we put ourselves out there. We, we say to God, God, look at how I'm putting myself out there for you. Look at how I'm sacrificing. Look at what I'm doing. But, but again, we get this... This gentle reminder from Jesus here today, what he said to Peter, he says to our hearts today as well, put your, put your sword away. Put away any notion that, that you have somehow assisted God in this rescue mission. Put away any pride that puffs up when you think that God must really be pleased with you. Put away any thought to a reason why you deserve heaven, why you deserve to be loved by God in heaven, put your sword away. Put away any defense of self. And look to his cross. Because there we find redemption. There we find peace. There we find salvation. Heaven secured for us. I'm always torn during the season of Lent. Because you come to church, and church should always be a happy thing, a great experience where I'm, I'm refreshed, and yet, you know, the minor keys in the hymns, and the, 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 the lessons are a little bit more serious when talking about the, the raw reality of the ugliness of sin. And, you know, but it's good for us to do that, to not try downplay it, to not try and dismiss it. And for the next 40 days here at church, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be examining some sins that maybe make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, that maybe cause you to kind of recoil and cower and not want to be exposed. And maybe, maybe your sinful nature is going to pipe up and try and justify the reasons and all the objections as to why you were totally justified in why you behave the way you do and how come you act the way you do. But again, like what Jesus said to Peter, so also our God, our Savior says to us, put your sword away. Put away any of those thoughts because when we do that, we can truly focus on Jesus is the one who, who has fixed the mess we've made with our lives, that Jesus is the one who picks us, picks us up, our, our broken souls and mends us together, that Jesus is the one who has assured you and me that Though it's Ash Wednesday, and though we're reminded that one day we'll all be dust, we won't be dust forever. Because of Him and because of His cross. May God bless us as we do that for His glory and purpose. Amen. At this time, we have opportunities to bring our offerings of thanks to the Lord.
You can do that by placing that in the uh, offering baskets that the ushers will be walking through the aisle with or by going to the church website online. We'd also ask at some point, if you wouldn't mind, please just scanning the QR code that's on page 10 in the worship folder just so we can follow up, especially if you're a, a visitor here worshiping with us today. Again, we thank you for being here. Hope that you'll come and join us again for worship on a Sunday. Those of you who are joining us online, again, please share this video with anyone who could hear the peace that Jesus brings. With that, then we bring our offerings of thanks to the Lord. in praying together. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we begin our 40-day journey of Lent, uh, we reflect on the sobering reality that it's our sins that caused our Savior to walk to the cross. May you continue to fill us up with hope and peace and joy as we anticipate Easter's glory and the assurance that, that Christ has conquered death and that our sins are secured and buried away with his blood. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as, as people reflect on the, the impossible awesomeness of your grace, may you assure troubled hearts and wearied souls everywhere that their sins are forgiven, that you are their, their loving Heavenly Father, and that they are accepted in your sight because of Jesus. Jesus, who had no sin but was made to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of you. We pray also for those who are carrying any heavy burdens in life, those who are sick, those who are depressed, those who are lonely, those who are torn by conflict and personal relationships, and those who are victimized by war or injustice, all those who are facing terrors in this life with a heavy heart, Grant them, O oh Lord, peace, and in your mercy, be with them each and every day. Allow them to be surrounded by family members, friends, Christians who can hold up for them the joy of peace and the assurance of forgiveness. Hear us, Lord, also as we bring you our private petitions in silent prayer. All this we ask in the name of our Savior Christ Jesus, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue our worship with the singing of our next hymn, My Worth Is Not In What I Own. You can note on the, in the worship folder instructions, the choir will introduce the first two stanzas as well as the uh, first refrain. And then the congregation is invited to join in singing after that. So the choir is going to make their way up towards the front here. Um, just one note as they do. In the first verse, the second line that the congregation is instructed to sing, there is a typo. 
it should say, but life eternal calls to us at the cross, not us to us, if that makes sense. So, but life eternal calls to us at the cross. We'll join in singing that hymn then together. Please stand for closing prayer and blessing. God, all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Good evening. Thank you uh, for, for coming here today. Again, welcome to everybody who has come here tonight. Um, I was informed today that uh, this is the first Ash Wednesday service that Peace has ever had. So in 10 years, this is the first Ash Wednesday, hopefully the first of many. So thank you so much for being here. We, we were scheduled to have one last year, but you might remember we had those, uh, whatever, Category 4 hurricane that t that came through and started ripping the tent up and everything like that so we had to had to cancel last year just because it was just too windy um so i'm glad that you could come here today which was nice um thank you to everybody that helped set everything up again since this is kind of a out of the normal service so thank you for your service with that and then i was also asked um to to thank the congregation on behalf of robin billingsley uh, we had a prayer for Robin and for her son, who was admitted to the hospital, but then released from the hospital this weekend. And she said she was just absolutely overwhelmed uh, by the outpouring of love and text messages and prayers and, and things that people did uh, to, to support her during that time. And, and it's just nice to know that that's what we do as a church family, that we, we look out and love on each other. And so uh, Robin said she she didn't want to say anything, and so she knows I can talk, so I, she asked me to do it instead. So thank you for doing that, and thank you for loving her. Um, did I miss anything else? Okay. I wish you God's richest blessings tonight. Drive safely as you get home, and uh, may God bless us as we, we start this first step in the next 40 days of our Lenten journey. But again, as we know, looking at his cross, we see the empty tomb there in the background, and uh, knowing, knowing that he loves us. So God bless your week, and we'll see you Sunday, hopefully. Thank you. Hello.